now my pleasure to call on uh, and invite uh, Dr. Mudit Tyagi, uh, Senior Consultant at LV Prasad Hyderabad, who has a special interest in uh, inflammatory retinal diseases and uveitis. So uh, Mudit will uh, play his talk of Sai system. So Sai, can you bring up uh, Mudit's talk? Just a moment. Yeah, and while we are about it, I think uh, just to add to this, uh, Dr. what Dr. Anita said, female phobial skysis has been actually uh, kind of talked about in literature too. But uh, like you mentioned, I mean, all the genetics is... That's uh, the non-excellent yeah. retinoscesis. Yeah, non yes, I Absolutely. described it long ago. Non, and yeah, non now call yes. it the sniffer. Yeah. Yeah, sniffer, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Good evening. First of all, I would thank VRSI for allowing me to talk about some atypical presentations in uveitis. And before I proceed, a happy Independence Day to all of us. Now, uveitis is one entity where you can have multiple atypical presentations of the same disease. And it's that intriguing aspect where you need to put your thinking cap on most of the times. So I'll be presenting three cases. My first case is that of a 36-year-old male patient who came to our clinic with a sudden blurring in vision in the right eye since the last three days. At the time of presentation, his visual equity was 2160 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. And what we saw was a presence of these choroiditis lesions over here. Along with that, there were granuloma superiorly as well as inferiorly. And you can see the subvascular pigmentation superiorly and along the inferior temporal aspect and also some of the subvascular pigmentation and some patches in the periphery. Autofluorescence reveals the presence of this hypoautofluorescent area along with some hyperautofluorescence inferiorly and this choroidal lesion with hyperautofluorescent margins superiorly. An OCT through the macula revealed the presence of cystoid macular edema and an OCT passing through the granuloma revealed the presence of a choroidal lesion over here with AC cells and a picture which was classic of a choroidal granuloma. So based on the presentation of subvascular pigmentation, granuloma superiorly and inferiorly, we arrived at a clinical diagnosis of ocular tuberculosis. And when we investigated this patient on expected lines, the MON2 came to be 30. The chest X-ray showed a few atelectatic lesions and few healed lesions and enlarged bronchopulmonary lymph nodes. The patient was non-reactive for HIV. So that kind of confirmed a diagnosis of ocular tuberculosis. But to our surprise, both VDRL as well as TPHA came positive for this patient. And we do test for syphilis serology for every single patient which is seen in our uveitis clinic. And so because VDRL and TPHA came positive, and on account of the fact that both of these tests have got a high specificity, and VDRL also, though having a low sensitivity, we have got TPHA which has got more than 90% sensitivity also for ocular syphilis, we decided to treat this in lines of a syphilitic uveitis. There have been reports of choroidal granulomas as a presenting sign of secondary syphilis. And therefore, we went ahead and treated this patient on the same lines. So the patient was given crystalline penicillin for 14 days. And after two weeks of IV crystalline penicillin, what we found was that the granuloma superiorly as well as inferiorly had regressed. And an OCT shows a complete resolution of macular edema over here. And an OCT passing through the granuloma shows the complete resolution. And the entire granuloma seems to have disappeared. So within 14 days on crystalline penicillin G, we found that most of our lesions had gone. So what initially clinically presented or had a clinical appearance of a tuberculosis turned out to be a syphilitic granuloma. So this is what we see after two weeks of IV penicillin. Most of the lesions have regressed completely. And at one month, the patient visual equity had improved to 2030. So it's important to remember that when it comes to syphilis, the triponemal tests like TPHA stay positive regardless of treatment or disease activity. And like I had said earlier, they have got a high sensitivity and specificity for ocular syphilis as compared to VDRL which is a non-triponemal test. Treatment of syphilis is on lines of what you do for ocular syphilis is similar to that of what we do for neurosyphilis with 18 to 24 million units of aqueous crystalline penicillin G given 
for 14 days. So the take home message from this case is the fact that syphilis can be a great mimicker and it can present in any sort of way. And therefore it is imperative for us to keep it as a differential for all uveitic entities. My case two and case three are kind of similar, but I will just deal with them. So this was a patient who presented with this triangular sort of a lesion in the periphery with this area of retinitis and this area of vasculitis over here in the periphery. And this patient was treated as an ARN and had been started on Velasivir before the patient presented to us. But the patient's retinitis lesions were not responding. And when we saw the patient, what we found was that apart from this area of retinitis, this patient also had this pigmentary scar over here. And the presence of a pigmentary scar and non-resolution of the retinitis on antivirals made us think that are we dealing with an ocular toxoplasmosis? And toxoplasmosis also has been known to present with lesions similar to acute retinal necrosis. So we treated the patient with Bactrim DS. And after two weeks, the lesions had started regressing. And at one month, most of the lesions had regressed. So this is the second case. And the third case is of a 29-year-old lady who presented with sudden loss of vision since 20 days, had these multiple areas of retinitis. This patient was seropositive, incidentally, and was initially thought of as having a CMV retinitis and was treated with two injections of gencyclovir. But even in spite of giving gencyclovir, these lesions had not regressed. And when we did an OCT, we found this entire area of retinitis with this vitreous adhesion superiorly at the edge of the retinitis lesion. And we have seen this sort of vitreous adhesion very commonly in our toxoplasmosis cases. So we started this patient on treatment for ocular toxoplasmosis, though we also did a vit biopsy and a vitrectomy and gave intravital clindamycin at the same time. PCR reports were negative for HSV as well as CMV, but were also negative for toxoplasma. But after starting that patient on treatment with clindamycin, the lesion started regressing. And so we continued the patient on Bactrim DS. And at two months, most of the lesions had completely regressed. And you can see this fibrosis and scarring nasally. And the macular lesion has completely regressed. And the patient's visual acuity had improved to 2030, which is maintained even now at more than one year of follow-up. So the point to remember is that toxoplasmosis can present with a picture similar to ARN. And atypical presentations of toxoplasmosis can occur in seropositive patients. And my last case of the day is of a patient who presented with sudden decrease in vision in both eyes since four days. And what this case highlights is that all that you see in retina or all that you see in choroid may not always be uveitic. So this was a patient who presented with these bilateral kind of symmetrical lesions in the right eye as well as left eye and a history of decrease in vision since four days. A multimodal imaging helps in better delineating this lesion. And what you see is this lesion with central placoid lesion and these radiating margins superiorly, which are emanating from the lesion, somewhat like a herpetic or a dendritic sort of an extension. So autofluorescence again revealed the presence of this placoid lesion over here with these dendritic extensions. And FFA was done, which showed initial areas of hypo, which then subsequently became hyper. And an IC also showed areas of this hypofluorescence in both the right eye as well as in the left eye. And this subsequently there was pooling of dye and staining over here. And OCT angiography through these lesions showed the areas of flow void areas in both the right eye and the left eye. OCT through the lesions showed these areas of damage or a photoreceptor damage over here and this hyper intense lesions over here or this hyper reflective lesion which was suggestive of a photoreceptor damage which had occurred in both the eyes. So on repeated history taking, finally this patient revealed that the patient had been trying out lasers. And this was incidentally then finally a case of handheld laser induced maclopathy. So the important point to remember is that not all coronal lesions may be uveitis. And when you see patient with a lesion like this, with a central placoid lesion, but with these emanating dendritic margins, it is important to keep a differential of a laser-induced maclopathy. So this is a case which was not actually uveitis, but was initially thought of as uveitis. But a careful history taking and looking at the pattern made the diagnosis pretty simple. So central plaque-like lesions with vertical linear lesions emanating superiorly and inferiorly can be a clue to laser-induced maclopathy. 
and laser induced myelopathy can lead to choroidal ischemia which can be identified with the help of oct angiography with that i would conclude all three of my cases and once again i would thank vrsi and wish everybody a happy independence day thank you thank you so much mudit i think they were really interesting cases and it makes you thinking not to be all the time diagnosing uveitis i would uh, request uh, professor gupta for his comments please i think you are muted sir so you are muted you are muted sir sir please unmute uh i think the last case was uh, very impressive you know uh, when we saw a similar case uh, some years ago it really foxed us and unless you are aware of this entity the laser pointer injuries you know you are likely to be uh, mistaken all the time so you have to keep that in mind particularly in children you know they keep playing around into you know these laser pointers very powerful they are available in the on amazon and other places very cheap and uh, one has to be aware of these for your cases uh, the syphilis uh, i think we have always tested all our patients uh, you know for syphilis because it can present any which way so uh, uh, i would always uh, investigate them for that rule it out before jumping on to the tb gun you know uh, because uh tb can wait but syphilis perhaps, perhaps we can very effectively treat it treat it and uh, whenever we see uh you know a typical presentation i have a very low threshold for uh, doing a diagnostic surgery uh, and you have to keep in mind some of these patients uh, are undiagnosed uh, hiv patients and uh, uh, you may be the first person to see them and there may be mixed infections so uh, you know when you talked of gancyclovir and not effective cure rectal necrosis the patient might have had both toxoplasma and uh, varicella zoster or hsv so may, the mixed infections are in fact very well known in hiv patients so we have to keep all our options open in this patient but excellent documentation Uh, congratulations i think uh, we saw excellent documentation from uh, vinod kumar i think he comes out with absolutely fantastic cases every time i hear him uh, so great meeting thank you uh, dr anita any comment from you the uh, laser pointer thing is i mean that that if you seen that fluorescein and if seen that oct you know that's what's laser pointer injury and the curvy linear things that tick on our dendrites dendritic looking ones are absolutely typical and you want to look at the pupil margin to see sometimes you know there are little burns uh, at the edges of the pupil and if you see the hyperfluorescence on on fa it's nothing else but laser pointer and sometimes it's unilateral and sometimes it's bilateral there was a big discussion going on at duke and i told them this is laser pointer because actually i actually missed it the first fa i just like because they only had one fovea lesion i didn't have anything else and i said this is a typical for mp to have one eye and the other eye was fine it was a girl most of the time it's boys and it's they're all in the young age group and the most important thing is first to recognize second is they all have some sort of a compulsive behavior so they need um absolutely first of all you got to remove the laser pointer from them and you got to make sure that their friends and their siblings don't have laser pointers too otherwise they have this impulsive thing to go on doing it and they'll damage themselves it's a psychiatric condition so they may need referral to a psychiatrist so you have to be very very careful you have to take the patients into confidence first you got to take the kid into confidence in a separate room and get the history from the kid if he has a laser pointer and then you have to tell the parents separately so you got to be very uh, as when i just had a kid um Uh, just a few weeks ago with this and came much later on and the mother was not his mother and was a lot of family dynamics in the states that was very difficult to kind of go around but i had to kind of take them both of them separately into confidence and sort of uh, explain to them but we'll see what happens to the kid and then duke kid was a girl it's unusual for a girl but can happen as unilateral the duke guys were convinced it was a worm and they went and said oh we did laser and the worm's gone and then the lesions all became inactive because she was getting recurrent crops of lesions and then i told them i said this is laser pointer you have to watch out and things like that 
And then as soon as they diagnosed the worm, the kid said, oh, yes, I'm cured, I'm fine. And she came back with the second eye involvement a few days later. And then the minute they asked her, do you have a laser pointer at that time? The kid ran from the clinic and ran away saying that I already know that I have a worm in my eye and it's not a laser. So they, they deny. So you have to be very, very, I mean, you have to really watch out for these kids and somehow get the whole social um, people that are involved with the kids uh, care to kind of be involved so that they really take the laser away from the child. And sometimes, you know, their friends have it and their siblings have it. My kid said his brother had it. And it was a half brother, I think it was foster care and all sorts of things. So to be very, very careful of that. And those are, I mean, extra pointers that I would say, but otherwise those cases are very, extremely um, descriptive and classic and typical of laser injury. Uh, I just want to make a- Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mudit has already discussed with that case with me. And I think the whole attention in Mudit's presentation is on laser induced uh, maculopathy case. But Mudit, if we really think beyond and see that tomorrow, if I see a patient like that, uh, your OCTs are showing that inflammation is still active because you could see that the thinning has not yet occurred, scarring has not yet occurred. You are still seeing the hyperreflectivity, linear uh, signals are still present. So my question is that tomorrow, if I really see this patient, what am I going to offer him? Am I going to say that he, this is a laser-induced maculopathy? Let's have one more conference and present that. Or are we going to offer them some treatment? So should we be considering giving them some form of intravitreal steroids to reduce the inflammation, which might, which might reduce the scarring at the photoreceptor layer? Or should we be offering them some sort of treatment if somebody else can come up with? Because I was just thinking that there is an active inflammation and we rarely see, like Anita said, uh, we rarely see these cases at an acute stage, but you were lucky to see that. Should Do you think that we should be offering them some form of steroid to reduce the inflammation? So we did actually- You are a specialist. You are very used to giving steroids. So we did end up giving this patient steroids and the patient's visual equity improved finally to 2050. There is still some, at the end of two months now, what we saw was some RP atrophy over there. But the point is, I still do not know whether my steroids helped or was it just a natural history in which the patient improved by itself. But then at that point of time, we had no other option. So we did end up giving steroids. Whether they have helped or whether it's just the way the disease has healed by itself is something which I honestly don't have an answer to. Would I you, think would the you, early lesions you, get better with uh, visual improvement. But if they keep on having recurrent um, uh, injuries, then they'll get, it'll get bad. So many of them get better. It's sort of like a little bit like... Um, uh, popper induced maculopathy, but where the lesions are in the out of nu nuclear, outer um, nuclear layer and they get better. So you, if you catch them very early, it's important. And I think with or without steroids, I think they get better. And um, unless they keep- I think Jay, there is a very important yeah. point. If you catch them in the acute phase with a lot of inflammation, a lot of edema, I, I've just uh, kicked a chat about a year and a half back where there was a toy burst. There's a toy burst and it's a bilateral, very florid, uh, injury, it was a burn through and we rushed in steroids, parental steroids as much as we could and it settled down over maybe a couple of weeks and that could never have happened if we had left the patient uh, to themselves. So I think that is an important point even, even for surgeons, you know, four wheel injury sometimes their filter doesn't come in even for, you know, surgeons. I think the first thing is to go in for uh, steroids. I think, I think Maybe if, if, if I see, I, I might offer them intravitreal dexamethasone, which yes. works very quickly, dissolves very quickly, does not lead to any side effects. You might actually end up healing those lesions much faster than and prevent the collateral scarring. scarring. Actually, in one case, we did that for one eye. We did that for one eye. Very nice case. Thank you. Thank you. So I was in particular interested, uh, Mudit, in your first case, and I wanted to specifically ask Professor Gupta. The first case where you showed, uh, you know, the very typical granulomas with the perivascular pigmentation, and even the mantux was extremely high, as high as 30 in your patient. So if clinically anybody was to see a patient like this, I think 90% uh, cases, you will diagnose it as ocular tuberculosis, what you also initially thought of. And the entire diagnosis apparently changed when you got a VDRL and TPHA positive. So I wanted to ask Professor Gupta, I mean, if you have a case like this, very often I know patients don't do a syphilitic testing, though I know it is mandatory these days. 
So, sir, what, what exactly would you be recommending? I mean, do you just stick to an ocular? Yeah, I look at it. Uh, I look at the hierarchy of evidence. You know, when I compare PPHA or VDR positivity versus the tuberculosis skin test positivity, in hierarchy of evidence, I think PPHA and VDR goes much higher. Okay, so I would like to treat it on the syphilis lines. Okay, for instance, in a patient with acute anterior uveitis and he's HLA-B27 positive and he has a Montus also positive, you know, we know that HLA-B27 is a much stronger association with acute anterior uveitis, so I'll ignore the TB test. Okay, but in the same patient, if I had a TPHA positive, Okay, I will think again because TPHA is not ordinarily false positive. You know, VDRL can be false positive, but not TPHA. So if it is positive, I'll think of, uh, you know, considering syphilis as a possible uh, cause of that acute anterior uveitis. So I like to weigh the balance and the, uh, in what order of evidence we are going to treat. So I decide on that basis. Thank you, sir. And over to you, you. Anand. Thank you uh, very much. I think we've had an absolutely exhilarating session. I mean, I, it's just left me to thank, uh, first of all, Professor Amod Gupta for taking time out and, you know, as usual, enlightening us with a fantastic talk. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Anita Agarwal, who's been such a great support to all VRSA activities and her knowledge is encyclopedic. She brings with herself the experience with none other than Don Gas. And of course, coming from PGI Chandigarh also, and uh, thank you so much, Jay, for always sticking with us and giving in your insights. Dr. Uh, Mahesh Shanmugam, uh, Dr. Muna Bende, Dr. Shukla, Dr. Mudit, Dr. Vinod, fantastic talks, wonderful talks. It's been an uh, absolute eye-opener. It's been a perfect day for, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a right kind of ending for uh, an Independence Day session. Thank you so much and hope to join with you again in future VRSA. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And thank, I you. Like thank you, Manisha, too. For thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.